Today on Applied Science, I'd like to tell you about a technique called atomic layer deposition. This is a really cool technique to build up a layer on something like a microscope slide or a piece of glass. And we're gonna build it up atom by atom. And we control this by switching back and forth between two different gas chemicals that we flow across this glass substrate. So you may have heard of other techniques like sputtering or physical vapor deposition. This is another one in those bag of tricks of making a coating on something. But atomic layer deposition has a lot of cool features and some drawbacks as we'll see. So let's open up the furnace here and see what we got. This is the first time I've looked in here that's been running overnight. One of the um, features of atomic layer deposition is that it's very slow. So this has been running overnight. All right, looks like we've got some decent stuff here. I'm very happy. This is the first time I've seen it. And uh, I am gonna touch it with my hands because this thing is all over, but let's just, you know, see what we've got here. Ooh, nice. Part of the reason that I make these YouTube videos is to experience the highs and lows of uh, taking an academic reference and trying to put it into practice. So this is not even, you know, a fifth of the failed attempts that I've got. And after working on this thing for, you know, a few weeks on and off, uh, we're over here. And I'm really happy with this. I think this looks really good. Um, it's by far the best one I've made, which is convenient because I was going to make this video anyway this morning, <laughs> regardless of what came out of the kiln. So you get to experience the happiness, the highs that this thing's actually working. However, check this out. I just told you that this technique is amazing because it builds up a very uniform layer, atom by atom. And if you search for, you know, atomic layer deposition on Wikipedia, it'll say, oh yeah, we lay down a layer of atoms and then we lay down another one. And so it's perfectly uniform. And one of the things that ALD is used for is coating very deep holes. So imagine you had a hole that was, you know, one millimeter in diameter and a meter deep. ALD is actually able to coat the inside of that hole <clears throat> completely uniformly with a metal or a ceramic or whatever you're doing with it. But as you can see, you don't need expensive lab equipment to tell that this is not evenly coated. There's way more copper on the ends here than in the middle. And similarly, on the glass bottle, it's a little bit better. It's a little bit more uniform, but you can clearly see through the glass at the neck of the bottle and even down here, it's, it's definitely not uniform. So what's the deal? Like I say, you know, taking academic papers and trying to make them work in the real world is kind of what's fun about this and figuring out where the imperfections are. So clearly there is some technique involved. The system doesn't work perfectly all by itself. And in the span of, you know, coming up with all this, I'm going to relay to you all this stuff that I found. And some of them are pretty interesting problems. Some of them are pretty dumb problems, too. And so we'll get to that one first and get that one over with. And then, um, you know, we'll take a look at some nice looking copper coated stuff. Let's take a quick look at some of the other techniques to make a coating on something. And then you'll see why ALD was such an exciting technique, you know, if it works. So in the beginning, there was evaporation. And the way this works is you just take a material and heat it up in a vacuum. And eventually, as far as I know, all materials vaporize when you get them hot enough. And the atoms or molecules fly out of your hot pot of stuff here and go in a straight line and hit the substrate, the thing that you want to coat, and freeze there. They condense and become a coating on top. So this is very straightforward. It has to be done in very, very high vacuum. If you had any gas molecules between your source and your substrate, they would get in the way and cool down these hot molecules. So that wouldn't work. Like if the molecule gets cold on the way here, it won't stick to the surface because it's already condensed and made sort of a metal cloud as opposed to a metal layer on your thing. So you need really high vacuum. And another upshot of this is that there is no mechanism for these hot uh, atoms and molecules to change direction. So once they leave the pot, they're going to go in a perfectly straight line until they hit something cold. Um, e this could be good. Like, for example, if you put a mask in front of this substrate, you can uh, have very nice sharp details. The shadow will be perfect. But if you're trying to make a uniform coating, it's not so good. Or if there's microscopic scratches on your substrate, even the scratch is kind of like a crevice. I mean, at the microscopic level, and no matter how you shine your beam of, of um, you know, atoms or molecules in here, the crevice will actually shadow itself and you won't end up with a perfectly uniform coating. So if you're trying to make an electrode or something, you really need this thing to be completely coated so it doesn't short out. Or if you're making microchips or something, you want a perfectly even coating. So partially to address this uh, and also other things, the technique of sputtering is often used. So instead of operating in vacuum, 
we operate at lowish pressure, say 50 millitor, let's just say for example. And the way sputtering works is we use an inert gas like argon and accelerate those argon, uh, first we ionize it and then uh, accelerate those argon ions into the target, which rips off a little piece of it. Let's say it's copper metal or titanium or something. And the cloud of stuff above this sputtering area is very hot, it's plasma. So even though there's tons of, air, of, of uh, argon atoms in, or, you know, moving around in here, they don't actually cause the target uh, molecules to cool off on their way up to the substrate. So we can get away with having these things bump into other gas molecules on their way up because this whole thing is very hot, it's a plasma. And the fact that we're operating at 50 millitor means that you know, the, the molecules have time to change direction and it's not quite as directional as this one. Okay, you can also kick things up a notch. For example, instead of putting argon in, or in addition to argon, we could add something like oxygen. So if we were sputtering titanium and we had argon and oxygen up here, when a titanium atom gets ripped off the surface, it can react with the oxygen and become titanium dioxide. Then when it hits the surface, we've now formed a layer of titanium dioxide. And that's much easier than trying to sputter titanium dioxide itself. But the point is that you can have a chemical reaction in this cloud of plasma, and you know, it opens up possibilities to make a whole, kind, a whole bunch of different um, compounds here by adding a, a processed gas. So kind of extending that idea, this chemical vapor deposition uh, became a thing, where you can add two different gases to your chamber, and this operates at higher t uh, pressure again, let's say 10 torr, and the chemical reaction here has to be set up such that your substrate is hot and the two gases are reactive enough and you put them in at the right quantities and the right pressures and the right flow rates and everything else. You can control this process. So for example, you could put in you know, oxygen and something else. They combine and form an oxide coating on your substrate. The neat thing about this is that since we're at higher pressure again, the uniformity is very high because the gas flows all around it. So if evaporation is super directional, sputtering is yeah, pretty directional, CVD is not directional at all because the gas can flow around everything. But there is still some amount of control not happening here. Like for example, your substrate might be very slightly hotter in one region or there could be a surface imperfection that causes the reaction to happen faster or slower. So even this is not ultra, ultra uniform. And that's where ALD comes in. In this process, we start with just one precursor and it coats the entire object and we can take our time. Like we can spend a few seconds coating the substrate with the precursor A, let's call it component A. Then we pump all that out of the chamber and then we add component B, which reacts with all of this A component that's stuck to the surface and makes the product that we want. Then we pump all that out and go back to A which lays down a fresh layer of that and we do a cycle and cycle. So every time you go through an AB cycle, you end up with um, one more atomic layer of whatever we want. So you can see the difference here. If there were a really deep hole, like a blind hole in the substrate, with CVD, what might happen is these process gases get in there and they get used up at like the top of the hole. So they never really get down to the bottom of the blind hole because they're reacting with each other and it's depositing the material kind of as quickly as it can get to the surface. But with ALD, since each gas only forms a monolayer, then we can take as much time as we need for the gas to diffuse down to a deep hole and it's just truly perfectly uniform, at least in theory it is. So the next question is, well, why does this A component not form like a super thick layer? Like why does it only form a monolayer if we're adding more and more A gas to this chamber and we're at 10 torr and the substrate's hot, why doesn't it just build up a huge chunk of stuff on there? That is because the substrate is actually hotter than our source. So the mechanism by which we get this monolayer stuck on our substrate is not condensation because this is actually hotter than where this source gas A is coming from. So it's actually just, just plain old adhesion. Like we basically have to carefully clean the substrate and choose our process gases so that it sticks there in just one layer. And once one layer is down, uh, the, the uh, gas A is not sort of attracted to itself. Once you have one layer uh, stuck to the surface, it's no longer sticky and it doesn't grab any more due to the temperatures and chemical affinities involved. So you do have to pick the chemicals carefully. This doesn't work with 
just any random set of chemicals. Uh, and choosing chemistry for ALD is, of course, a huge topic of research. So let's see what this thing looks like in real life. Uh, on the left, we've got argon coming in the yellow hose and pure hydrogen coming in the red hose. And we actually have three flow controllers that the computer is controlling via a Teensy. So the Teensy sends serial commands to those flow controllers, the alley cat, and the flow controllers regulate A and B. We turn one on to get A in, and then we turn B on to get the other. The reason that we have three flow controllers is because we also have to have a sweep gas that uh, sweeps the chamber of all the A before we switch to B. We can't have A and B in there at the same time, and there's no other mechanism that we can use to quickly get the chamber free. It's true we could use a vacuum pump to suck it all out, but that would take a very long time to get all the way back down to hard vacuum and then add A, and then go all the way back to vacuum and add B. It's actually much quicker to just have a constant flow of argon, which doesn't participate in the chemical reaction. So that's why there's three there. And then we feed them into this quartz tube, which is in a furnace. And interestingly, the furnace is a little bit colder here, which is where we're evaporating the copper one chloride. And we use a stream of argon to sort of pick up the copper chloride vapor. And it's hotter in the middle of the furnace, which is where the deposition is actually happening. So the evaporation is happening at about 350 C, and the deposition is happening about 415. So clearly we're not, don't think of this as like we're boiling something off over here and then condensing it over here. That's not what's happening. It's actually this, just this surface adhesion thing. And I have temperature control or temperature monitors to uh, sense the temperature in the middle of the kiln. And I even went as far as putting a, um, a thermocouple feed through through this spark plug to measure the temperature right at the evaporation source. Uh, we've also got a pressure gauge here so you can read off the pressure. And then on the other end of the tube, we've got a vacuum pump and a needle valve. And the idea there is that we can set up a flow rate and then close the needle valve slowly until we achieve the pressure that we want. So it seems like a very simple setup, and it is, but that's because I've already debugged the problems. And um, oh boy, oh, I had a ton of funny bugs to get through this. Well, we'll start on the left here with these flow controllers. You do need flow controllers to do this because remember, we're building up only one atom per cycle. So those copper uh, articles that you saw at the beginning of the video were about 800 complete cycles and each cycle takes 30 seconds. So there's really no way you can manually do this with valves. You need a programmable flow controller to switch back and forth between the gas flows. And these are actually pretty expensive uh, and difficult to get. So new, these are about $1,000 a piece or even kind of used used good ones with a nice display like this are about a thousand dollars. I got a killer deal on these on eBay and it took about a week or two to figure out how to use them. So nicely enough, Alicat actually provides their programming manual online, but um, these are so old that the protocol was not operating quite the way they said it was. And I had to do a lot of reverse engineering and figuring stuff out. And anyway, it, it, it took a while, but eventually we got these running. And um, I verified the flow rate by bubbling some gas through a tube. Also confounding these valves leak a tiny bit. I can tell because if I unhook from the gas supply and put a cap on there and then pump down the chamber, the uh, pressure is quite low, it's good. But as soon as you um, either uncap this or put a, a slightly pressurized gas in, uh, it, it, you know, the pressure starts rising. So that's just something I had to live with or maybe I'll try to fix it someday. Um, I really like these uh, taper or these um, flare fittings. These are really quick and easy to deal with. McMaster sells hoses and fittings and you can really quickly put together a, a system by having those flare fittings. The next problem, I was using the wrong chemical. So the way this works is we got to get this copper chloride vapor. So I'll pull this out so you can see the setup. Um, we want to basically turn on and off the stream of copper chloride vapor very quickly. So one way you could achieve this is to have like a hot plate inside there and we raise the temperature to get copper chloride vapor and then we let it cool down. That, that would work, but it's just way too slow. Like we really need to turn the vapor stream on for five or 10 seconds and then turn it off and have a very definite on off sort of cycle to that. So the way that we can achieve this is to have a flow of argon through a test tube that's inside there, kind of like this and one end of the test tube is connected to our pulse gas, which is argon, and inside the test tube we have our chemical, and on the end of the test tube there's a little cut, 
it's just a, a hole I cut in there with a, a diamond bit. So the idea is that when the gas flow is on, we get copper chloride vapor coming out of here because it's hot. So this thing will be filled with the vapor. And when the flow is zero or close to zero, nothing comes out or goes in because that's another problem. Um, so, so when I first read the paper weeks ago, it says, oh yeah, yeah, use copper chloride. Okay. So I rushed over to the shelf and I was like, ah, perfect. I've even got it in stock. Copper chloride, right? Yeah, here we go. And then, you know, I know the difference between copper one chloride and copper two chloride, but there were a few confounding factors that kind of led my mind down this uh, path where I wasn't thinking. In the paper, they mention our sample was contaminated and it was bright green. So then we washed it in acid and dried it over the weekend and it turned gray. And I was like, okay, mine's green too, no biggie. So I also washed it and put it on the hot plate and mine turned brown. And I thought, well, you know, it's, I mean, I'm buying this stuff off eBay or Amazon or something. It's probably a teeny amount of contamination. Sometimes just a very small amount of contaminant will cause it to be colored. And I thought, yeah, it's just brown coloring in there, no, no big deal. So for, so for a long time, I was using copper two chloride, also known as cupric chloride, when in reality, this whole process doesn't really work unless you're using copper one chloride. Oh, I see, yeah, it's a different chemical. So, you know, when you make a dumb mistake like this, if you're like me, you try to fix it faster, like the dumber the mistake, the quicker you try to recover from it. Whereas if it's a really kind of honest mistake, you feel like, well, hey, I did my best. But when it's dumb like this, you try to get in there and, and fix it fast. So I, I ordered the right stuff off eBay, but in the meantime, I really wanted to get this working. So I searched for a synthesis of how to make copper one chloride. And as it turns out, it's pretty easy. You just mix some of the copper two chloride in water, and you mix that with some um, sodium sulfite in water, and it forms this really nice precipitate, very nice fine white crystal powder, and you vacuum filter it, and you wash it with a little bit more acid and alcohol, and you dry it in air, and you're done. You end up with really nice, very fine white crystal copper one chloride. Another problem I had is that this tube furnace is quite large. Like in the literature, most tube furnaces are maybe 50 or 20 millimeters in diameter. And this is like, I don't know, 40 or 50 or something, or more than that, even 70. And so in all of the flow rates, I have to sort of scale them up from the papers, but a lot of things don't scale up like that very well. And it, you know, it gets to be messy. So I use a small test tube like this to get the vapor out into a much larger diameter tube. And that's not quite how the paper showed it, but there's another challenge here. We have to keep the hydrogen away from the hot copper chloride or else we'll just form copper metal in there. So the reaction is copper chloride plus hydrogen yields copper metal and hydrogen chloride gas, or otherwise known as hydrochloric acid when it meets a water molecule. So if we were to have all this stuff interconnected with the hydrogen blowing across everything, we would just end up with a little mound of copper metal and that would actually stop the reaction because the copper metal would coat the chloride and then nothing more would evaporate and we'd slow down to nothing. So the reason that we introduce the hydrogen in this small tube is to sort of keep it away from the copper chloride. So my idea was that uh, the, the sweep gas is introduced at the end of the tube over here, a constant flow of about 500 standard cubic centimeters a minute. The pulse gas is low, it's about 75 standard cubic centimeters a minute. And the hydrogen is introduced like further downstream. I don't know if this idea worked super great or not. As you can see, there is still quite a bit of copper metal forming on the outside, a teeny bit on the inside of the copper chloride tube there too. But anyway, things started working at the end, so I, I think it's basically okay. On the exit end of the furnace, you can see there's this nice rainbow haze forming on the inside. And if I pull the tube out a little bit further, you can see there's this definite onset of the hazy area, and then it kind of tapers off and we have this really nice interference this is either excess copper chloride that didn't get used in the reaction, and so it's, it condensed here where the tube is very cold on the output side of the furnace, or uh, it could be a contaminant that got uh, evaporated away, or maybe it's even some other reaction product or something. But it does seem weird that the whole tube is hot. Obviously, it seems like there would be copper. It would just kind of use up all the gas. So this might be a contaminant or something else. I'm not really sure. But since I mentioned that the byproduct of this reaction is hydrogen chloride, your vacuum pump is gonna be sucking down hydrochloric acid. And so you're either gonna to wanna to put a filter in there or you know, change your pump oil or use a pump you don't like very much or something. 
uh, keep that in mind as well if you try this. In modern industry, I don't think anyone uses copper chloride. It's considered uh, one of the original things that ALD was done with, and it's good for demoing because it's not toxic. Most of the chemicals that are used in industry are organic metallic substances if you're going to deposit a metal, like tetraethyl lead, for example, is an organic metallic. And that's the same stuff they used to put in gasoline to make it leaded. The problem with organic metallic um, substances is that they're super toxic because they're readily absorbed by the body in a lot of cases. And some of these compounds are really complicated. They're huge molecules and very uncommon. You would not get them unless you were looking for ALD precursor supplies. So then they're hard to get and expensive and everything. And demoing the system with copper is nice because copper is, you know, a really handsome metal. And copper chloride is a very easy, relatively non-toxic thing to use to, to demo the process. The last really big problem that um, was surprising to me was the surface prep. So since this is a very, um, since this process is so sensitive to the surface, like for example, if you have an object in there that doesn't absorb copper chloride because of chemical, you know, affinities, then it won't be coated. It's as simple as that. So dirty glass may not actually be coated because the dirt doesn't catch enough copper chloride to get this whole reaction started. So cleaning the glass is critical. And even though I've done a fair bit of critical cleaning for other projects, this one required a level much higher than I have needed in the past. Um, at first, I started with my typical, you know, um, basic alkaline, you know, ultrasonic clean, and then water and alcohol and everything. And that didn't work at all. Like, even though I could tell there were other problems due to the, you know, the wrong chemicals being used and everything else, the coatings were still really just nasty and very inconsistent and everything. So I figured, okay, well, I'll, I'll break out the big guns. We'll go to plasma cleaning. I mean, this is a great technique because you can do it in situ. So you take your samples and clean them in the normal process, then load them into the chamber and ignite this plasma. Uh, I was just using air, but oxygen would be even better. And the idea is that these energetic oxygen molecules or nitrogen molecules hit the surface and oxidize and blow away the dirt that's there. And this is actually a really good technique. I'm not sure why it didn't work in my case, but in fact, it did not. Um, I, I did another run and it was still broken. And uh, it's possible that the plasma wasn't energetic enough or it didn't, you know, it wasn't enough oxygen or whatever. But I also thought maybe the problem was that the plasma was getting into the copper chloride vessel. So then the next run, I did plasma cleaning outside the chamber and put the stuff in and that still didn't work. So what ended up working was good old RCA clean. This is a really aggressive chemical cleaning process where you mix um, ammonium hydroxide with hydrogen peroxide, and it makes this really vicious bubbling bath that dissolves oxide or dissolves um, uh, hydrocarbon contamination on the surface. Then you rinse that one and put it into a nasty, an even nastier bath of hydrochloric acid and hydrogen peroxide, and that dissolves all kinds of ions. And, you know, just touching the tweezers to the top, you know, instantly dissolves a little bit of metal off the end of the tweezers, you know, stupid me. And so I took uh, some plastic tweezers and got them out of there. And this cleaning process was pretty good. Um, I still had problems, but that was mostly due to the air nozzle that I used to blow these off. Even though I have an air purifier with drying beads and filtering, it's still not clean enough to use for this level of process. And don't use those handheld dusters either. Those things contain a huge amount of contamination, a uh, bitterant, but even besides the bitterant they intentionally put in there, I think there's other oils and hydrocarbons. Uh, you cannot use those compressed gas dusters to clean something after you've gone through the trouble of doing RCA level cleaning. It's kind of funny, after spending so much time cleaning a surface to this degree, when you go back in the house to you know clean your, your dishes and your cups and stuff, that's not even really cleaning. Like that's just kind of scraping off huge chunks of food and putting it back away again. Like it's, it's a whole different game of what clean is. And for a process like this where you're relying on copper chloride molecules to adsorb to the surface, it really just has to be incredibly clean. Like I say, this is the most sensitive process that I've ever worked with that requires such a high level of cleaning. So the last unsolved mystery that I'm going to leave you with is these glass bottles. If you look, they all have the same pattern on them. The coating worked pretty well from about here to here on every one of these bottles, but the neck and the top of the bottle and the very bottom have a different character to them. Either there's a line there, it's not coated as well, and all of these were cleaned in different ways. Some were plasma cleaned, some were wet cleaned, some were etched, some weren't. 
Some were um, coated with the wrong chemical, copper two chloride, some were copper one chloride, but they all had this weird pattern in there, even despite very, very aggressive cleaning. And one of these, I think I did an acid piranha, um, sulfuric acid piranha, which I didn't talk about, but that one I cleaned out in one of them. So all these different surface preps still yielded this very weirdness about it. And, I, you know, I used different flow rates and everything. So this was not like I put them in in different orientations in the chamber. So this, I don't think this had anything to do with what I'm doing to the bottles. I think there's something inherent about the glass that makes them more likely to accept the copper chloride in this region. I have no idea what though. It must have something to do with how these bottles are manufactured. They all came out of the same lot. I have a huge box of these things. And I just thought that was very strange. But it, it also makes me think that this whole ALD process is super surface sensitive. Like it may work on certain surfaces. Silicon dioxide, pure quartz might be fine. But certain types of glass may have too many ions in it or the surface just doesn't have um, enough uniformity to, to work with this process. So again, it's like one of these things where you read on Wikipedia, oh, ALD is perfect. It makes this perfect atomic coating. But then when you get down to it, it's like, well, it only works on certain surfaces or it depends on your precursor chemicals or you have to heat it up to a certain temperature and then it changes in the cleaning process and so on. And so even though it sounds like a downer, it's, it's actually great in a way to just learn what the limits are. Um, a good analogy is for EEs, when you learn what an op amp is, it sounds like this amazing thing. And then when you get out into the real world, you realize, wow, there's hundreds or even thousands of op amps in existence because they're all imperfect to some degree. And choosing the right one is kind of what engineering is all about. That's, that's what makes it interesting, is working with limitations and figuring out how to get what you want. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions about ALD, now is a good time to put them in the comments since it's all fresh in my mind. All right, see you next time. Bye.